So, uh, uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, earlier this year, Trish Greenhalgh called a meeting, a small meeting in Oxford, where I met our next speaker. The meeting was about real versus rubbish EBM, where a group of us talked about the way that EBM and the perceptions of EBM have changed uh, over the years. And that's where I met uh, Neil Maskery. He, for 10 years, was director of the National Prescribing Centre. He's a GP by, by background, and he now works as consultant clinical advisor to the Medicine and Prescribing Centre. And I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing what he has to say, as, as we are looking forward to, and have enjoyed hearing all the speakers, but not least in Neil's case, because of the very enigmatic title of your talk. Neil, thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Delighted to uh, uh, be here. It's uh, great to stand up, and you've got some heroes in the audience, and uh, I hope I can do justice to what I want to talk about, which is actually about human behavior. It's about how some of the seeds, the wonderful seeds that you create, sometimes get sown into the stony ground of delusory certainty. One of my uh, colleagues said many years ago, I'm going to get some T-shirts for the people I work with, and it's going to say, I wouldn't believe that even if it was true. <laughs> so that's what, uh, that's what this is about. Um, in your um, name badges, you've actually got a, if you fold it out, there's some space for notes. This is the place that it would be great if you could join in with a pen or something else. If you want to use the iPhone and the notes function, that's, that's fine too. But it's more fun if everybody joins in. My instructions were to be entertaining. Um, if you want, which whilst you're sorting yourselves out, if you want more stuff, we've got some resources on our old... NPC website around evidence-informed decision-making. Trish Greenoff and I wrote a series of papers a few years ago. We even made a film of that. Um, there's a couple of merit bulletins still um, available. Papers have been published. There's a BMJ blog. The top right I put up just to honour some of the people who I've worked with. This is Dave Slauson and Alan Shaughnessy's paper, which was published in 1994. So we're still working our way through that systematic review of the evidence to the point at which we realise this is, this is important. There are lots of people's work that I rely on. Um, I'll try and acknowledge as we go along, this is the opportunity to do that. I do indeed stand on the shoulders of giants. And my final bit is I'm speaking for me today, not for nice. Um, don't think this is nice policy, although we have some very interesting conversations. <laughs> So your stuff is at the left-hand side of this blackboard, this complicated stuff that you all do so wonderfully. The right-hand stuff is the clinical care of an individual patient, and we need to do something better than hope for a miracle. Okay? We need to explore what goes on in the decision-making, how we translate from one to the other, and we don't have, really, decision-making very much on the curricula of people who are we expecting to make decisions. And that feels like a really important miss. Although, we're getting there. So you guys are the foundation stone factory. I use your stuff all the time. It's wonderful. There's nothing I'm going to say today that would undermine my belief in that what you guys do is one of the great creations of civilization. OK? I don't want you going away. <laughs> It's just that there's a bit more to it. Have a look at some of the quotes from some of our qualitative stuff. Um, I'm in a job where people's lives depend on the fact that I make the right decision, and sometimes I feel completely overwhelmed with the fact that I don't know enough information about critical decisions. I just feel overwhelmed with all the information. I wish I had more time. I'll put aside time for more things, but it's just hard. <clears throat> Critical appraisal I like. I have a pile of BMJs at home this high, but I don't ever read them. <laughs> I sometimes carry them around in my bag in case I kind of <laughs> osmotically. <laughs> I know I'm not superhuman, but with the progress of technology means there's more access to information than ever. I need to find it better. That's what it feels like. 
And there's one of your Cochrane reviews just sitting there. <laughs> Let's go back to that evidence-based medicine conversation that we were having in, in Oxford. When you look at this, this is all about the care of individual patients, making decisions for individual patients. It didn't say create an industrial scale guidance producing factory and let's dump lots of information on people. It's about the best available evidence. Importantly, the patient's needs, values and preferences. I'm not going to talk about shared decision making and all of that in this section because Al's going to do it next. I made the right call and left it to, uh, to him. But that's really important and an increasing... Uh, focus for, for all of us. And we blend all that. That's the nirvana, blending all of that with clinical skills and expertise. It's not about the information overload stuff. And boy, is there information overload. <coughs> Typical quiet medical take, 18 patients, 44 diagnoses. So multimorbidity is everywhere. Um, if you go for the guidelines relevant to those 44 conditions from the UK, in the last three years, that's 3,679 pages. If you take two minutes to read each page, that's 122 hours of reading for one on-call take. 25,000 journals, increasing at 3,500 a year. One and a half million articles a year. 20 million papers in PubMed. And it's not a new problem. This is the long room at Trinity College in Dublin. Ancient tomes from floor to ceiling. This room is 100 metres long and these stacks are on both sides. Information overload is not a new phenomenon. It's impossible to read, learn and recall at the appropriate juncture everything that could possibly be relevant. So let's say how we become an expert. Let's say we want to become an expert in echocardiography. How many people have done a clinical role at some point? Hands up, just so I can... Or, okay, so that's most people. Okay. The rest of you imagine you're a clinician. <laughs> so, thousands of papers published a year. This is Sarah Fraser's stuff in the BMJ. So let's assume we have a new entrant to this subspecialty, and they start reading papers at the rate of five an hour. So they read one every ten minutes and have a break for ten minutes. So to get through all of the papers, because of course it's a cumulative um, uh, uh, publication of all of these stuff, you would need to read 408,000 papers and it would take you 40 years, almost 41 years, by which time you can retire. <laughs> So if you look on the cartoon channels, <laughs> Sylvester never catches Tweety Pie in those cartoons, and we need something better than trying to get up to date and stay up to date just by reading stuff. Particularly when we need to repeat this in the era of the internet and social media and all the rest of it, but an hour a week with 30% of specialists reading nothing. It's a bit of a problem. I want to just digress slightly from the entertainment. This is a serious point. People get frustrated when faced with that problem because they're looking for solutions. Yeah? This is a complex problem to which there are no solutions. This is a problem akin to having a great relationship, sorry, Carl, or, or bringing up a child. Yeah? You can read all the books on relationships or all the books and papers published on child rearing and you're not guaranteed a great relationship or a well-rounded adult at the end of it. Clearly, there are some things that are better than others. And when it comes to getting information into practice, evidence into practice, better decision-making, we're not doing some of those now, and I'll point to those in this short session. But we can't fix it. This isn't like building a car, or dare I say it, constructing a systematic review or a guideline. You can't break it down into a process and apply quality steps at each stage of that process. There are human elements of this that are inherently non-fixable. So not solutions, but some things are better than others. Are you ready with your piece of paper and a pen? A list of word follows. Look at them once. Don't reread them. When you've read the list, close your eyes. Nothing bad will happen. There's no gunk <laughs> tank in the ceiling. The closing your eyes is a cue to me that you've read the list and we can move on. Are you ready?
Okay, most people have read the list. Write down as many words as you can remember. <laughs> It's about 15 seconds on the Google start. <laughs> I suppose on the level of intelligence, we have the top 1% of the population in the room. <laughs> Anybody want to try and keep going? How many, is, how many people have got about four? Yeah, most people get about four. Six? Very good. Eight? Twenty? Okay. Now, just to have a check, did anybody misremember a word? Has anybody corrupted something? Yes? Quite a few. Isn't that interesting? It was a simple task, wasn't it? Read these words and remember them. Yeah? But we misremember things very easily. Now, the other thing to look at is, did you remember your <coughs> words predominantly from the A or B at the top? Hands up. Predominantly from D and E at the bottom? <coughs> Scattered all over the place? Brilliant. It splits up into about a third, a third, and a third. So that's interesting. Okay? But nobody remembered 20 words or anywhere near it. So you can't set about reading all of those books or all of those systematic reviews or anything else. This is groundbreaking stuff uh, that's many years old now. This is bounded rationality. Herbert Simon won the Nobel Prize for it. Our normal approach to making a decision is to collect just enough information to reduce our uncertainty to the point at which we're able to make a decision. That's an important phrase. Just enough information to the point at which we reduce our uncertainty to the point at which we're able to make a decision. It's called satisficing. Occasionally we'll get stuck and we'll maximise, but most time we're, we'll satisfy. We are not the Mr Spocks of this world. We are much more like the Captain Kirks. Who's bought a car in the last three years? Hands up. OK, lots of people have bought a car in the last three years. Um, very quickly, let's just uh, take a, a random sample. Tell us what you did, how you went about buying your car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm probably the, the last person you should ask about. <laughs> this, this, this isn't a test. <laughs> just, just describe how you went about selecting a car. It's not hard, come on. <laughs> Your hand went up. <laughs> Probably the colour, yes. <laughs> okay. Who else wants to contribute? <laughs> I'm slightly worried now. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, Val. It was, it was actually for my, my wife, my second wife, who's, uh, <laughs> who's, who's a lovely woman. Um, I was very proud. It took 70 minutes from uh, turning my laptop on and the browser to test driving the car and signing the documents. <laughs> Anybody else got a tactic? <laughs> I loaded my son's wheelchair and equipment into the back of the car and drove that to the showroom and the first thing we did with every car was see if it would fit in the back. go on. We've got limited time and I want to hear Al. Um, I've done this many times with many audiences in many workshops. Nobody has ever said, I went to the Society of Automotive Engineers <laughs> website. <laughs> I read the systematic review on engine testing theory and practice. <laughs> or laminated. You see the point? Brief reading, talking to other people. That's how you go about selecting a car. That's how largely you make a decision. Most of the time, it's satisficing. And when we look at the ethnographic research on real clinicians, joking apart, <coughs> clinicians rarely access a praise or use explicit evidence directly from research or other formal sources. Rare exceptions are where they get stuck. They didn't use the word maximise. 
uh, John Gabby and Andre LeMay, but that's what they meant. Instead, they rely not on guidelines, but on mind lines, collectively reinforced, internalized, tacit, so not written down anywhere, informed by brief reading, but mainly their interactions with each other, opinion leaders, patients, pharmaceutical reps, and other sources of largely tacit knowledge that builds on their early training and their own and their colleagues' experience. Stony ground, indeed. So let's look at the other bit that's interesting. Dual process theory, that's bounded rationality. This is dual process theory. So who knows the story of Noah in the Bible? You're all afraid to put your hands up now. <laughs> Who'd like to tell us the story of Noah in the Bible? Somebody at the back put their hand up. Come on, I'm coming. <laughs> Who's <laughs> We're going to have an argument over who's going to tell the story of Noah in the Bible. Well, Russell Crowe. <laughs> Hollywood ruins my presentation. Le <laughs> Left Australia. <laughs> I'm going to give it to her though, she's far better. No, absolutely not, no. <laughs> I'm going to forget the story of Noah. Um, well, God said there would be a big flood. So Noah being a, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, God no, a, a God-fearing person built a big boat yeah. and took lots of animals on, yeah. the odd person, <laughs> yeah. and um, shut up shop for about 40 days. Yeah. yeah. Big flood. Big flood. Sent out a raven, didn't come back with anything, sent out a bill, came back with an olive branch. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Repopulated the world, everything's fine. Yep. That was not it? Okay, just let me get back down here. I knew that film would be trouble. <laughs> Imagine you're working as a doctor in a remote village. It's the weekend. There's no other healthcare professional around, but you have a new piece of technology called the Marveltron. <laughs> the Marveltron will save the life of any patient you're treating, but you have to answer correctly the question the Marveltron asks of the attending doctor before it works its magic. <laughs> Got it? A young child is brought to you. She's seriously ill and will die imminently. You switch on the marvel trying to await the question. Importantly, you won't be blamed if you get the answer wrong. You only get blamed if you don't try. OK? So you get the wrong answer, it doesn't matter. Piece of paper, pen, something to write with. Are you ready? Serious medical emergency. According to the Bible, how many giraffes did Noah take into the ark? <laughs> answer quickly, write it down, child is dying. End of answer period. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase, because time is short. How many wrote down two? Fantastic. Where did you get the evidence for two from? <laughs> Serious question. OK, the nursery rhyme. It's Disney, actually, isn't it? The animals went in two by two? Yeah, yeah. Has to be true, doesn't it? The animals went in two by two. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens. The male and the female. And of the beasts that are not clean, by two. Yeah. So what are beasts that are not clean? Well, you have to go to the forest plot at the back. <laughs> Whatever part of the hoof and is cloven-footed. So that's a cloven-footed hoof of a giraffe. Giraffe's footprint on the floor. YouTube video of giraffes chewing the cud. The answer is 14. Not two. And your brain is now saying, I wouldn't believe that even if it was true. <laughs> I've had people now going to their iPhones and Googling Bible.com. <laughs> I've had an Orthodox Jewish pharmacist reading the Hebrew on his iPhone from the Torah and saying, after five minutes, gosh, Neil, you're right. <laughs> 
So we've learned the pattern that the animals go in two by two. We are great at recognizing patterns, faces, songs. Things stick with us very well if they're a pattern. It's an evolutionary thing. We needed to recognize friends from enemies, berries that we could eat, berries that we couldn't eat. We're really great at pattern recognition. In fact, we're so good at pattern recognition that it overwhelms rationality. This is the dual process theory, how it works in clinical practice is that if you've seen something before, you make a very quick diagnosis. Or if you've treated something before, you make a very quick entry on the drug chart or the prescription pad. If you haven't seen something before, you have to work through it much more slowly and deliberatively. This is fast and effortless. This is slow and deliberative. Sometimes we'll uh, see some new information, and our type 1, our pattern, will override it because we do. We, I wouldn't believe that even if it was true. If we're learning, and we have to learn new stuff, we have type 2 overriding our existing pattern. This is relatively easy. This is relatively hard. That's how it works. We don't teach it to people. It's actually dual-dual process theory, because as I hope you'll demonstrate in a moment, in an emergency situation, you can go from patient presenting rapidly to a diagnosis and rapidly to the emergency treatment that saves a life. Nothing wrong with system 1. Nothing wrong with system two. They just work differently, but we prefer to be in system one because we're cognitive misers. We're lazy. All together, big breath in. What's the answer to this sum? <laughs> now, I'm going to do that again. That's not right. <laughs> I'm sorry. All together, big breath in. What's the answer to this sum? OK, that's system one. You didn't have to think about it. It came to you straight away, yeah? All together, big breath in. What's the answer to this sum? <laughs> that's system two. You have to go away and work it out. Say out loud what you see on the next slide. Very good. Now, it's a long time since you had to diagnose a Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Seriously, it's a, it is probably a very long time since you saw a picture of a Margaret Thatcher. Yeah? Okay, there was the funeral 18 months ago, something like that. But we don't see a Margaret Thatcher every day, and yet straight away, that pattern comes to mind. Yeah? She was Prime Minister a long time before some of you were actually born. Yeah? But you recognise that effort, effortlessly. That pattern recognition, that system one, comes to you very quickly. Um, what's this? OK. The clinicians say shingles. Get a group of GPs together, establish principles of general practice. It's like a Welsh chorus. <laughs> Straight away, everybody says that shingles. What emergency treatment does a seriously ill adolescent need? Uh, parenteral antibiotics. This is meningococcal septicemia. Parenteral antibiotics is the emergency treatment. Those people who've done this before did that dual-dual process theory and saved the life very very quickly. Um, say out loud what you see on the next slide. Mm, OK, let's go back to medical school. I'm the professor of cowology. Um, I spent 20 years researching that rare but important condition where a human being turns into a cow. <laughs> Note carefully, students, the shape of the brow, the ears, the eyes, the jawline, <laughs> and, and, and the nostrils. And we do all the pathophysiology, the surgery, or small group work, lectures, all the rest of it. And I'd take you onto the ward and I'd show you in bed 17. The patient admitted last night. <laughs> And you'd say, what a great teacher I was, because indeed the shape of the ears and the <laughs> nostrils and jawline and all the rest of it does indeed look like the one that we talked about in the lecture theatre. And then we'd do a bit of more work and eventually we'd get to differential diagnosis. <laughs> and if you could pass that test in finals, there would be some point to this. Because two years later, you're an F2 doctor working in A&E, and somebody <laughs> presents looking like this. And whilst it's not a typical cow, it's close enough to being a cow for you to say to your registrar or consultant, I think this might be a case of a cow. <laughs> and you'd look really good. That's how good your brain is at pattern recognition. There are a few people still getting this, yeah? 
Your neighbours will now point out. <laughs> Got it? That's how good your brain is at acquiring patterns. We exploit it mercilessly in our day-to-day -day life and in our day-to-day -day work. And sometimes it works for good. Nicky's just got it. <laughs> okay, now look at the screen hard. You can all see the cow, most of you, yeah? Now close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now open them again and try not to see the cow. <laughs> Because once you've spotted it, once that pattern is imprinted, it's very strong and very difficult. You can't go back to that place where you were two minutes ago not seeing the cow because the pattern recognition is so, is so great. This is how we learn. We move through from being consciously incompetent and not knowing how to do stuff. Learning is hard, purposeful system too takes a long time. At the point of assessment, providing we think about what we're doing, we're just consciously competent, we need practice which drives system two into system one to get us to the stage where we can do day-to-day -day tasks when we're unconsciously competent. We can do other things whilst we're doing it. That's a fine place to be. The problem is if the evidence changes or the pattern doesn't quite fit what we spot, at that point we're unconsciously incompetent and we've got to go away and learn again. Okay? We hate learning. We hate system two. We love system one. Who's this? Jesus. I can tell you this isn't Jesus. <laughs> this is a few cinders on a piece of toast. But it makes us think it's Jesus. System one thinking, pretty strong stuff. <laughs> There's even this two-bedroomed end terraced house <laughs> that looks a bit like Hitler. <laughs> You're a good audience now. Importantly, I don't want to see anybody in a moment doing this, OK? You can do this task with a spike through your head into your thorax, yeah? Keep the head straight up. I mean it. It's no fun if you don't. Who is this? Big breath in. Thank you. So you can all do it even when it's upside down. Let me put up two Margaret Thatchers side by side. Now watch the right hand one on the dual projection. Watch what happens when I do this. That is so good, like New York, I'll do it twice. <laughs> Watch the right-hand one. <laughs> so what's going on there? That's not a, a, a trick. Um, if you turn your head upside down, do that. Once you get past the 45, or 90 degrees rather. Yeah, do the eyes and the mouth twist. So you get the right-hand one, yeah? When you twist it upside down, it's not a trick. It's just the way your brain works. You have, you're able to recognise Margaret Thatcher and you blank out the bits that don't fit with the Margaret Thatcher because the pattern recognition is so strong, the analytical mode doesn't engage. People have put, done this test with people in functional magnetic resonance imaging. Your brain fires off if you have a Margaret Thatcher that's been adjusted with a, with a, with a, with a mouth and, a, and eyes that are upside down. It just doesn't reach your conscious level. It's suppressed by that magnificent thing called your brain. Steve is shy and withdrawn and very helpful with little interest in people. He's a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Which of these is it most <laughs> likely that Steve is? <coughs> Librarian? You know lots of librarians. Some pharmacist, yeah. It's one of those two, isn't it? No, it's not. This is a cognitive bias. It's called base rate neglect. 
there are almost certainly many more farmers. The prevalence of farmers is greater than any of the other options up there. Even if a small proportion of farmers have an introverted trait, there'll still be more farmers than any of the others. Our brain is so good at pattern recognition, it wants to use it all the time. You created a pattern from the words at the top of the page, and you applied it to the stereotype that you have in your head of the sorts of people who are farmers, librarians, members of parliament, disc jockeys and so on, and selected the appropriate one. This has important resonances for diagnostic stuff. It features heavily in membership for the Royal College of General Practitioners. There's about 100 of these cognitive biases, and the, their root is in we like to use that pattern recognition rather than something more rational. So. Um, some of these, a gambler's fallacy. I've seen three people with crushing central chest pain going down their left arm in the last week. I admitted them all to hospital. They all had heart attacks. Here's this fourth person with crushing central chest pain going down their left arm. They can't possibly be having a heart attack, can they? Because I've seen three in the last week. Complete nonsense because the relevance of this constellation of signs and symptoms in this patient is in no way influenced with what's presented to my clinical practice in the preceding week. But it's hard to switch off that pattern. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the most uh, often missed fracture in the X-ray department of any A&E? Scaphoid, no. No, not hip. The most commonly missed fracture is the second fracture. So here's this whatever that hurts. I look at the x-ray, there's a broken bone, I stop looking. Yeah? I've done the pattern recognition, I've recognised something, I've got my reward for those years of training and dedication. Here's the diagnosis. Lots of these. The most important one is the bottom one, the, bi the blind spot bias. The fact that other people are susceptible to these, but I as a clinician, I'm not. <laughs> there are serious consequences from all of this and not knowing what's going on in our own heads. This is the prescribing of diclofenac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory painkiller, widely prescribed, millions of prescriptions in the UK. Indeed, when we started looking at this in 2005-06, 46% of all NSAID prescriptions were diclofenac. The context here is that we'd had rofecroxib withdrawn from the market because it increased the rate of heart attacks than people who used it. The absolute increase was about 3 in 1,000 per year, so it wasn't great. But diclofenac has a molecular structure very similar to rofecoxib, a COX-2 selectivity very similar to uh, rofecoxib, and not surprisingly, people started to do research looking at whether traditional NSAIDs had the same cardiovascular risks. The context at the time was we were choosing NSAIDs on the basis of do they give you GI bleeds or hemorrhages or, 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 or perforations. So quite a different paradigm from where we were. And indeed, at this point, a systematic review was published in the BMJ showing that diclofenac increases your risk of cardiovascular events. Note the dramatic effect on prescribing. <laughs> the second line is the Dear Doctor letter from the MHRA, the Drugs Regulatory Agency, saying, this is the research, think about your clinical practice. Note the change in prescribing. I've all written diclofenac down many times. I've never caused a heart attack. Well, you never looked for them. You never knew it was happening. I'm still fixed with my pattern of what I was doing. This is when we published a four-page review and started up some conversations at a local level. Note what happens. Um, Northeast gets the message early, continues downwards. West Midlands thinks about it for a bit, gets the bit between its teeth, cut, starts coming down. Southeast Coast thinks about it until here, and then starts thinking about it. We get a widening of the variation in clinical practice, and then it narrows up here. What do you think happened at this point? We started paying doctors to do the right thing. <laughs> Prescribing points came into quaff. It's time to say it. This is wrong. This is completely wrong. We shouldn't wait six years in this case and have another study published saying we're still prescribing lots of diclofenac. I had ankle surgery at a national orthopaedic centre for my exercise-induced Achilles uh, tendinitis. And uh, you know what my discharge medication was? Diclofenac. 
for a month at 150 milligrams a day. No conversation with me whatsoever. So this really matters because the people getting the diclofenac are somebody's father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter. So evidence into practice is a serious thing. This level we calculated when we published is 2,000 premature or avoidable heart attacks in England each year associated with diclofenac, confirmed by the MHRA when, before we published, of course. This is a serious business, and not knowing how we make decisions is a serious default in the way we're going about things. How many of you think the people still prescribing diclofenac were unintelligent, lazy, uncaring, or uncommitted? <laughs> it's not the case, is it? People work their socks off in clinical practice under enormous pressure. Sure, you see that prescribing and want to give them a slap. <laughs> Believe me, slapping people doesn't work. <laughs> we need to find a better way, and we've been striving for that for a bit. This is me trying to find a way from evidence to practice, and it did feel for a while that I was a bit like this chap with a bunch of, ham <coughs> bunch of nails and a hammer and some planks of wood, and I'm sort of nailing them randomly, trying to form a bridge. I think we're better than that now. The behavioural economics that I've shown you today, the pattern recognition overriding the rationality, is a really important thing that really helps people understand how they're going about that. It's a really important thing to recognise that brief reading and talking to other people are really important components of how we move from evidence into practice. So your podcasts and the Twitter and the, all the rest of the stuff is absolutely the right direction to go. But most importantly, decision makers, everybody, because we're all decision makers, really need to know how they go about making decisions. That has to be better than you not knowing how you and the people you work with make decisions. There are some problems. Numeracy is a problem. About 5% of doctors that I talk to have a real problem just doing fractions to percentages or decimals to fractions, not the relative risk, absolute risk issue. Yeah. Clinicians and, more importantly, the general population also have a problem with being what Ger Gigerenser in his new book calls being risk savvy. Understanding the fact that the chances of you dying in a plane crash are, are infinitesimally small and not easy when there's been a plane crash the previous day. And understanding your emotional reaction to that new information really matters. I'm not going to do the shared decision making mm -hmm. stuff, but those things apply to the shared decision making stuff, which um, I am absolutely in favour with. But we've done the industrial scale production of shared decision aids, and it's a minority sport mm -hmm. in their use. The other point to make is we've done this research into national guidance on an industrial scale. But actually, to get some of this thing into clinical practice, there's two more translations needed. A translation from national guidance to the local care pathway, because care in a locality is always different. And then the translation from that local care pathway with individual patients. Back to the what's evidence-based medicine all about. It's as much about values and preferences and eliciting them and discussing them and caring for people in those dark, tender moments as it is in knowing what the evidence says. So, keep building the foundation stones. Absolutely vital, love you to bits. Great honour to be here. Pre-digested summaries of evidence incorporating those foundation stones, absolutely the right way to go. Brief reading. And then, if you get the chance, support those of us who are trying to do something about decision making and indeed shared decision making. At the very least, Think kindly of us. Thank you very much. Th thanks very much, Neil. Thanks. Now, um, last year we had two visitors from Dartmouth, uh, Lisa Schwartz and Steve Woloshin, and I'm delighted to say we're continuing a sort of Dartmouth theme. It's an enormous pleasure 
to have really, I would say, the world's expert on shared decision making, Al Mully, to talk to us today. Al, for 35 years or so, was uh, head of the Division of General Medicine at Harvard and Mass General, and he's now moved to Dartmouth and has done some very, very special thinking about shared decision making. And Al, thank you very much for coming, and we're very looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege uh, for me to be here. I've had a long association with the uh, uh, Cochrane Collaboration and um, have great regard for what you have done. And, and that's reflected in um, the title of my talk, The Last Mile in Delivering Value with Cochrane Evidence. I think what you've done has been extraordinary. And um, few others have contributed as much to determining what the probabilities of good and bad outcomes are when we use different interventions in different <laughs> contexts. Um, when Martin and I spoke about my um, joining you, um, he gave me a good and accurate description of the diversity of the um, audience. Um, he asked me to err on the side of entertaining rather than technical. Um, Neil made no error, um, <laughs> and I, but I will not be as entertaining as, uh, as he was. Um, Martin also asked me to tell a story, as, as he suggested, um, I've been engaged in ideas related to shared decision making for a long time. And um, he pointed that out to me uh, in a way that I interpreted after I put down the phone as a very polite way of telling me that I'd probably be the oldest person in the room. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take some risks here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story, and I hope you don't feel that it's too self-referential. I, um, I'm, and I'm going to begin with a, with a little bit of personal information. I am incredibly fortunate. I am incredibly grateful for the opportunities I've had. I've had more of a vocation than a career. Um, I was the son of uh, two uh, immigrants, one from Poland and one from Newfoundland, both with eighth grade educations. Uh, those of you who know North America may know that in America, in the US, they tell disparaging stories about people of Polish origin. In Canada, they tell the same disparaging stories about people of Newfoundland origin. I have a thick skin, <laughs> so I'm going to take some risks here. Also, my father became an iron worker. He climbed steel for 30 years of his life, and I was climbing steel with him 500 feet above Boylston Street from the time I was 16. I did it for nine years, uh, 30 months over nine years while I was in high school, um, college, and medical school. So I know how to take risks, but I also know how important it is when you're working uh, with others to not put others at greater risk than yourself. No one wants to be part of a team where you don't work together to mitigate risks. And that's an important part of shared decision making and um, part of why I feel so strongly about it. Now, um, as I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some material that's pretty self-referential. I hope you'll forgive me for that. I went to Dartmouth in 1966, the year after we passed Medicare. For those of you who haven't been there, that's the iconic building. That's called Dartmouth Hall. And um, it was a great opportunity for me for reasons that I've just mentioned to you. Um, this is the biology building. Um, given my background, I knew I wanted to serve in some way. I didn't know what opportunities um, were available to people um, who had a university education. Um, I never needed a lawyer, I didn't need a doctor, so I was interested in medicine and I was taking all of the pre-medical courses. However, uh, I was engaged by the biology faculty to join them, three students, three faculty, in designing what was the first human biology course in uh, North America. And it was meant to bring the science of health and healthcare um, together with social issues. And at the very first meeting of that six-person um, committee, um, one of the biology professors bought six, co six copies of a paper that had been published just the week before. This was December of 1968 when I was a junior. And this isn't the issue. This was a, a commemorative issue. Um, the paper was The Tragedy of the Commons, written by Garrett Hardin. And it was a parable, a very cynical, pessimistic parable about a certain kind of market failure when people don't govern themselves when they're dependent upon the same common pool resources, as you all are in the National Health Service. Um, I read it. Um, we had just passed Medicare the, the, the year before in the United States. I was very interested in the National Health Service because I saw myself as the kind of person who would want to be salaried in a service organization rather than an entrepreneur. 
Um, and I decided after reading it that I should have taken some economics courses. I didn't have room, so I decided I'd only to apply to medical school where I could get a degree in economics um, as well as medicine and not be viewed as subversive by the medical faculty. And this was 1968, and the subversive concern was real. So I did that at Harvard, and that's Harvard Medical School. That's the Litauer building where the Kennedy School was housed um, when I got there. Again, incredible good fortune. Um, the Kennedy School PhD program did not exist when I made the decision to study economics as well as medicine. It was founded in 1970. I was in the third class. Preceding me were people like Don Berwick, who's well known in the UK, Harvey Feinberg, um, uh, Milt Weinstein, who contributed a great deal to qualities and applications of uh, decision theory to cost effectiveness analysis, uh, was in the first class as well and a teaching assistant. What was most interesting to me was what I learned from economists and others. Um, Howard Rafa used von Neumann Morgenstern axioms of rational decision making to create a form of decision analysis that's called normative or prescriptive, very different than what Kahneman, Tversky, Thaler, and others have developed over the years. Um, so it was about the rational actor trying to make a decision. Tom Schelling, um, his famous book was Strategy of Conflict. He was a pioneer in game theory. That's two-person decision making. And the two people may be collaborators or competitors, um, and I learned a great deal from that. Francis Bator is famous for having written the paper, The Anatomy of Market Failure. Another person that I should picture here is Graham Allison, and I would commend to all of you his book, Essence of Decision, because he, he, he writes about the rational actor model, organizational behavior, and what it does to decisions, and also the politics of policy making and what it does to decisions. And the, the theoretical chapters are interspersed with historical chapters about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I commend it to you. So I then went to Mass General. My two colleagues, David Blumenthal and Dave Calkins, went off to Washington, which is what was expected of people who had this combined degree. Um, I loved clinical medicine too much. Uh, my clinical clerkship was at the MGH. I tr chose to train there. Um, I was very fortunate in that there was a very humble basic scientist specialist who was chief of medicine at the time, Alex Leaf. I mean, he was the most basic of basic scientists. He studied, um, he, he studied uh, electrolyte channels using models from the toad bladder. Um, and he was a nephrologist. He knew very little about primary care um, or community health. But he was committed. Under his leadership, the MGH uh, founded community health centers in the poorest neighborhoods in its catchment area. Um, he established a general medicine primary care program, again, my great fortune. I was in the third class of that as well as the third class of the, of the Kennedy School. And the, the one-eyed man in the land of the blind, when I was an intern, signed a contract to write the first textbook of primary care medicine in the United States. And because of what I'd learned from economists, adapting what I'd learned from econometricians, and the master's thesis that I did on my way, which was cost effectiveness of screening for cervical cancer and uh, glaucoma, I knew a lot about quote unquote critical appraisal. So from the beginning, the first five chapters of this book um, were all about critical appraisal and evidence-based medicine concepts. Um, and all of the following chapters, 240 of them, were based on that um, model. But the story I most want to tell you relates to the fact that my first research experience was in intensive care. We were building a database, and this was Alex Leaf's idea as well. We were building a database to learn whether we were doing more good than harm. And that's the kind of question he was always asking. So we measured um, uh, attributes, variables, clinical variables, social variables of patients when they were admitted to the intensive care unit. We followed them through the intensive care unit. We followed them through their hospitalization. And every three months, we would reach out and follow them up. Uh, we did that for a total of two years. Um, eventually, we had nearly 5,000 patients in this database. I was also attending physician in the intensive care unit. And I'm going to tell you a story that changed my life. That story is about a woman who um, was intubated nasotracheally in the emergency room when she came in with severe respiratory failure due to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, more emphysema than chronic bronchitis. The clinicians know that means that it, there's not a lot of reversible there. 
at day 10, you always have to decide whether you're going to persist with this intensive care. <coughs> and if you do, you have to put in a tracheotomy. That's why there's a decision point. If you're not going to persist, you remove the tube and it's comfort care. It's palliative care. Very, very hard decision. I was very proud of the interns, the residents, the medical students, and the way they handled the family meeting. I actually felt that it was a good decision. I was walking back to my office thinking about how many patients like that do I have in this database so I can narrow confidence intervals around the probabilities so we can have more informed discussions. And it hit me. It didn't matter whether the probability of this woman surviving if we persisted was 1 in 50, 1 in 500, 1 in 5,000. Why? because that decision was much more sensitive to how she felt about how, where, and when she was going to die. What hit me was all of clinical research is about the probabilities. We've defined clinical science as excluding what is subjective and context-specific because it's hard to measure. And that changed my life. Now, just in terms of serendipity, this was just about a month before this paper was published. How many of you know this paper? Clem McPherson was the first author. McPherson, Hoven, Wenberg. And this was the replication of work that Jack had done in Vermont about a decade earlier. What he had discovered there when he was developing methods to create an epidemiology of healthcare was that he went there to show the world that there needed to be more doctors and more hospitals in poor rural northern Vermont. What he found when he developed the methods to do that was they didn't need more doctors and hospitals. And there was this bizarre variability in the care that people received. You were four times more likely to have a prostatectomy in one hospital market area than another, six times for hysterectomy, and what took the cake, Rich, was tonsillectomy, 17 times more likely in one hospital market area as opposed to another. And, and here's the geographic variation in rates of surgical procedures. Different rates between countries, U.S. always the highest, sometimes U.K., Norway was second. Regional variation within countries was similar. Higher variation consistently, tonsillectomy, hemorrhoidectomy, hysterectomy, prostatectomy. Lower variation, you can read the procedures. Variation was a characteristic of the procedure and the condition. Within country variation was not associated with the organization of financing of care. You had your NHS. We had an already market-driven healthcare economy, and Norway was somewhere in between, but with professional uncertainty. I read this paper, and I said, uh-oh. If all variation is viewed as reflecting professional uncertainty, people are going to think we ought to eliminate variation. When, in fact, I knew quite well that the decision made by Mrs. Jones in the intensive care unit might be a very different decision than Mrs. Smith and her family would make across the hall. So I went up and introduced myself to Jack. It was an excuse to go back to Dartmouth, a place that I loved. And we started working together. And six years later, we published three papers in JAMA. These three papers were the first three references for the request for proposals from the uh, Medical Treatment Effectiveness Program, creating patient outcome research teams. And basically, the request for proposals asked them to replicate what we had done studying prostate disease. The reason we so chose prostate disease is we knew the demographics of policymakers in our country, your country, and we knew that many of them suffered from lower urinary tract symptoms because of growth of their prostates. What we had done in this study is we systematically surveyed men um, before, after, three months, six months, 12 months, very much like the ICU, they had their prostates operated on. We did some Markov modeling. We were, weren't so much interested in the cost effectiveness. We were looking at what variables the decision was most sensitive to. And what we found is that there were three variables that the decision was sensitive to. One, the operative mortality risk. That makes sense. But the other two were not probabilities. It was the disutility of the existing lower urinary tract symptoms and the disutility of a health state that the men had never experienced and had to imagine. That actually was as much the reason Kahneman won the Nobel Prize as anything. The distinction between experienced utilities, that's how you feel about a state that you're living with, as opposed to a predicted utility. People misimagine future states all the time when they haven't experienced them. So misimagining, misremembering, I think misimagining is worse um, when it comes to <laughs> making faithful healthcare decisions. 
So what we did is we said, look, there's bad variation when care is not evidence-based. That's why I think so highly of what you do. <coughs> Poor research leads to professional uncertainty. Poor knowledge management, take Rich's term in what you were getting at, leads to professional ignorance. Research is done, but my doctor doesn't know. I'm no better off. But there's good variation. Good variation is what makes care patient-centered. It reflects clinical differences among patients. All doctors know that, but it's really hard to tailor the evidence to the patient in front of you based on more than one or two variables. Machines can do that easily, easily. And then there are these personal differences among patients. Utilities, risk attitudes, discount rates, to use the language of an economist, Carl would use, but meaning, to use the language of an anthropologist, we say what matters to patients and what matters most. Now, here's the, here's the important point. If all variation were bad, it would be easy to stop it. What's difficult is reducing the bad variation while holding up, keeping the good variation. And that was basically the message. Now, I'm very quickly going to take you through, I'm very quickly going to take you through um, uh, a few slides here that uh, show my roots. <laughs> yeah. um, Howard Rafer would like this kind of model. Um, um, here's a patient. You can, you can see the patient um, here. And let's, let's pretend that it's someone who is my age and has some modest lower urinary tract symptoms. At the time we did this research, there were no randomized trials, and there were no measures of symptoms. In fact, urologists would say, you can't make a treatment decision based on the patient's symptoms. How can you trust the patient to tell you what their symptoms are? They're so subjective. What they did is they measured post-void residual urine, how much urine is in the bladder after somebody thinks they fully voided, and urinary flow rates. Literally, they would ask men to pee on a pinwheel. How fast can they get it to go? That's what they used. Why? Because it seemed objective. It seemed part of the science. Men's symptoms didn't seem part of the science, even though it was what mattered most. So we developed something called the AUA-7. It became the IPSS. The IPSS um, had um, seven questions, so you'd have a score of 1 to 35. And you know what? We found that the symptom score wasn't enough. Because two men with exactly the same symptom score, 22 let's say, might be bothered more or less, dramatically more or less. Okay? So that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. So here's uh, alternative one, let's call that surgery. Alternative two is non-surgical therapy. If we blow this up, this blue triangle represents the man's current urinary symptoms. The um, yellow triangle is good. That represents symptom relief. He no longer is bothered by his symptoms. The green triangle represents an odd kind of sexual dysfunction called retrograde ejaculation. Um, if you want to know more about that, come to the afternoon session. <laughs> um, the black triangle represents death. Um, the blue triangle, remember, is what? That's the urinary symptoms. That's what he's starting with. It's what brings him to this decision in the first place. Most likely, if he, if he chooses non-surgical therapy, particularly back then when we didn't have alpha blockers, when we didn't have finasteride, He'd most likely continue to live with his symptoms. He might do a little border crossing, you know what I mean by that? So he's, he's no longer considered, you know, you have to have these arbitrary zones, mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, severe symptoms. And sometimes you just cross a border and it's not much of a difference at all, but it looks like it because of the way you measure and record. So here's, here's the province of what you do. How do you, how do you provide the best possible probabilities of different outcomes for different men who have different clinical characteristics. That would, uh, that's what I mean by patient A, patient B, patient C. Notice the mortality rates, 5%, 3%, 1%. So maybe this man has lung disease and heart disease, just lung disease, neither. He only has a 1% risk of death with this operation. And um, you can see how you could provide that information more effectively if you had in place a system that continuously learned from the experience of men by doing what I was doing in the intensive care unit and what we did with Turk when we tried to apply that model to this practice variation problem. Now over here is the zone which I think has been incorrectly defined as outside science. 
All of these men face the same probabilities, but just like Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Smith with the tracheotomy decision, have different utilities. They all think that death is least valued. They don't want that. They all think that symptom relief is most valued. This man here is not terribly bothered by his current urinary symptoms. You can tell that because it's over here on the right side. This is called linear scaling. This man here is a little bit more bothered. This man is very much more bothered. Other things being equal, who should be most likely to have surgery? Now remember, they've all got a score of 22. It's just how bothered they are. You with me? Who should be more likely to have surgery? The third one, right? OK, now let's look at this. The question mark is retrograde ejaculation, and none of these men have experienced it. This man, the way he imagines it, thinks it would be awful. This man, hmm, not quite so bad. This man, I, I can get used to that. OK? Who should be most likely to have surgery? The way I've drawn this, clearly, the third man, right? This man probably shouldn't. What about this man? What if he's at personal equipoise? <clears throat> Ian Chalmers talks a lot about that now. Is equipoise something that applies to a population, or does it apply to individuals? So let me just give you a sense. I hope this works. If I clicked on this middle picture here, can you see the? Yeah. If I clicked on this middle picture, you'd get a very erudite, simple language, very simple language, tested carefully. Description of the symptom measure. Um, uh, it, what really matters is how much it bothers you. And then you'd get a chance to hear some men. Notice where this is. So is this man really bothered or not? No. OK, listen. It's, it's annoying. I mean, it's bothersome, but it is uh, nothing that I can't live with. I say, as long as I know what's going on, it's going to happen, that probably won't get any better. Uh, I just accept it. A good example of somebody who probably shouldn't have surgery, right? Symptom score 22. Symptom score 22. Uh, I'm a construction worker, actually. I work on a roof, so there is a problem in, in terms of... Uh, uh, the logistics of all this. I'm, I'm high in the air, actually. And, and <laughs> it, it takes a while to get down to uh, whatever facilities are available. Initially, I would, I'd always be very refreshed when I wake up in the morning. I'm an AM person, and uh, as this has become more and more of a, of a problem for me, I, I find that uh, I'm not getting refreshed from sleep at all. I'm still virtually as tired when I go to bed at night as when I get up in the morning. So this is very much a factor for me. I won't take the time, but if I clicked on the middle, you'd get a description with an animation of what retrograde ejaculation is. Um, this man, not terribly bothered by it. This man, terribly bothered. So bothered, even though he has perfectly fine erectile function, has given up sex. You think hearing that kind of experience from people carefully selected from the distribution of disutilities might help people accurately imagine the alternative health futures that they can't control, but can influence with the choices they make, supported by their clinician. So what, what we are trying to do with um, shared decision making, and have been now for almost 30 years, is to um, get at the gist of the trade-offs that are made in association with these toss-up decisions. In the case of BPH, are my symptoms likely to be life-threatening? No. Many people confuse BPH with cancer. They're not life-threatening. What if I do nothing? Not much. It'll just get up and down like the stock market, progressively worse. You can decide to have surgery when you want. We'll just watch your renal function. Is surgery the only option? No, it's not. Will surgery change my sexual function? Yeah, it will. Let me tell you how. Okay. Quick conversation. Probably not to be done by the doctor, in my view. If you really want to, if you really want to move this into the mainstream, there are lots of people who can do this who can be trained to do it as well as the doctor. Concordance between patient values and care received. This is a, this is the cartoon version of, 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 of research that we did. OR is for odds ratio. You all know what that means. If a man has this level of disutility for his present urinary symptoms, he's seven times more likely to choose surgery 
than a man who is up here. If a man is really bothered by the prospect of retrograde ejaculation, the way he imagines it, accurately or not, you know, with all of the irrational stuff that creeps in, he's one-fifth as likely to choose surgery. When you take this knowledge of relevant treatment options and outcomes and you bring it together with the patient's preferences, we were stunned that it dramatically reduced the aggregate demand for surgery for prostate disease in the United States. We actually expected, this is the Dartmouth Atlas, 306 hospital referral regions, we'll talk about that in a moment. We actually expected the probability to go from here to here because we were working in staff model HMOs where the incentives pushed it down, it went from here to here. Just very quickly moving, sticking with the prostate, prostate cancer, you could do the same thing for prostate cancer screening. Three questions, one related to the natural history, one related, related to the information value of the test, one related to um, uh, the benefits and harms of treatment. With no attempt to inform people Men get the right answer not very often, 40, 10, 20 percent of the time. With just a little lecture, two or three minutes, a video that's less than five minutes or the two together, res correct response rates go up dramatically. Look what happens to the rate at which men choose to be screened. For the sake of easily avoidable ignorance, I would contend, just to be provocative, that we're committing battery on these men. And look what happens to their sense of autonomy, their sense of agency, personal agency. Without any information, they all think it ought to be the doctor or maybe I share the decision. Look what happens. Virtually none of them think that it's the doctor's decision when they get a little bit of help understanding the role of their utilities, risk attitudes, and discount rates. I'm going to move pretty quickly. We did this with breast cancer. Uh, again, lots of uh, examples here. Um, carefully chosen. We can talk about the research methods later. Probably the most interesting one here is coronary artery bypass surgery. In the 1990s, um, there was a rush. Every hospital in the country, community hospitals, wanted to do bypass surgery. They all wanted to do stenting. It was the most profitable DRG in American healthcare, and there was enormous capacity built to do this. Interestingly, and there's a book by a colleague, David Jones, that, that uh, came out of two papers that we worked very, very hard to get published but couldn't because they were so provocative. Um, the, the basic argument here is that um, most, of, most of the surgery and stenting that's done for people with stable conditions, post-MI, knowing they have heart disease, or stable angina, is done with the patient thinking that it's going to reduce their risk of a heart attack. There's no evidence that it does. 88% of Americans who have a stent place for stable angina think that it reduces their risk of a heart attack. Is that ignorance avoidable? So the interesting scientific piece here is that the first angiogram was done in 1958, Cleveland Clinic, Mason Sones. Um, there's no relationship geographically between cabbage and PCI, but there's a very strong relationship between angiography and one or the two. So angiography in 58 suggested remarkable localization of coronary disease, introduction of cabbage and PCI, produced visual evidence for cure, blood passing around the obstruction. Subsequent utilization showed strong correlation between seeing and treating with cabbage or PCI. That's what I'm pointing out here. However, stable plaque, plaque that's stable enough to grow across the diameter of the vessel is what causes stable angina. The plaques that cause the acute syndrome are unstable, they rupture, cause thrombosis, and that's how people die, have sudden um, heart attacks or have <coughs> acute coronary syndromes. And this was understood 1926, 1966, the year before the first bypass operation. It was the recognized model, and we just forgot about it because the treatment was so dramatic. We didn't resurrect vulnerable plaque until we had a treatment for it, statins, because the benefit was greater than could be explained by the reduction in cholesterol. Look how easy it is to explain this to a patient. This is less than a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. This one. Scientists used to believe that most heart attacks happen when a large plaque completely blocked the flow of blood in an artery. But not all plaques are alike. It now appears that, in fact, 
this kind of plaque is responsible for only about 15% of heart attacks. Many heart attacks involve a different kind of plaque. In these cases, it's not the size of the plaque that's the main problem, but rather its tendency to rupture or break open. When this happens, even if the plaque is relatively small, it can trigger a blood clot that causes a heart attack. Our new understanding of these so-called unstable or vulnerable plaques helps explain why some heart attacks occur in coronary arteries that are only partially narrowed and why medications that help stabilize plaque are so important for people with coronary disease. Now that's bookended here by a cardiac surgeon making that point. And um, you'll be interested in this, Rich. This is Dolph Hutter, who was president of the American College of Cardiology at the time we developed this program. Look what happened to aggregate demand for bypass surgery um, when this was subjected to a randomized trial in Toronto. Again, your, your, your eye is drawn to the mode. You think there's underutilization down here, overutilization here. When people can answer the two or three basic questions about the trade-offs, look what happened in a randomized trial. 26% reduction from an already low rate in Toronto, where, interestingly, they do a lot less surgery than we do in the U.S. So I won't take too much time with this, um, but this was uh, also a study in Toronto looking at the relative um, incidence of bypass surgery in the U.S. compared to Ontario. Um, and the blue, just quickly, um, this is 20 to 64-year-olds, this is 65 to 74-year-olds, this is 75 and greater. This is one or two vessel disease without a proximal LAD for the non-clinicians in the room. Um, that means your risk is pretty low of having a, 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 an acute event. Two vessel disease with a proximal higher risk and the highest risk. What this tells you is that if you have the lowest risk of benefit and the highest risk of harm because the cognitive and stroke risks are much greater with age, you're 17 times more likely to have surgery in New York or Boston than you are in Ontario. The randomized trial was done in Ontario, and the demand fell by 26%. This is the early 1990s. I'm not going to take the time, but this is just as well. So let's say somebody chooses ongoing medical therapy. If I, play, if I took the time, you'd hear this man say, my diet is, and he tells you the perfect diet. He is so disciplined. His avocation is martial arts. He'd be a great patient, but not a very fun roommate. <laughs> this man says, I was so afraid of dying, I wasn't really living. And my counselor told me, you need to cheat once in a while. You need to have your fried chicken. He'd be a better roommate. Right? If you give the wrong advice, if you approach this man the same way you approach this man, you're going to get nowhere, and vice versa. Every patient brings their own context. One of the things, this is controversial, I, I, uh, because uh, Ian Chalmers has been talking a good bit about this model, if you will, I, I feel comfortable showing it here, but it was very controversial when we introduced it for BPH and for back surgery. We called it a preference trial. Comprehensive cohort trials is another term that's been used in the UK. Um, I want you to pay attention to this because I'm going to come back to it, this, uh, this triangle here. Uh, what we were doing basically is saying, uh, remember the patient who was on the bottom wanted to have surgery because of his utilities. The one on the top wanted to have non-surgical therapy because of his utilities, disutilities, experienced and imagined. So we're saying if you're at personal equipoise, we'll randomize you. We're going to follow all four cohorts. And we actually expect the outcomes to be different. The more subjective the outcomes, the more different they'll be because of expectation effects. <laughs> and because you think this is what's right for you. There are models that you can use this, uh, to, that you can use to, to estimate, quantify the expectation effects, but you need large numbers. So this model comes together very nicely with the idea of, of, of large randomized trials. And the goal is to get better and better, narrow the confidence intervals around the probabilities of different outcomes, but capturing this critical data, which is of enormous value to policymakers. And we'll talk about that. If you make decisions 
in the face of easily avoidable ignorance at the level of the individual, the capacity planning, the commissioning, decommissioning decisions are going to be made in the face of what? Avoidable ignorance. So quickly here, I told you that Jack started in Vermont and um, why he went there and how he built this epidemiology of healthcare and found this mismatch between um, disease and healthcare. Um, he then divided the whole country up into 3,000 hospital market areas, coalesced them around the hospitals that could do advanced surgical techniques and neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, 306 of them there were at the time. And one of the things he found, variation of all kinds and in inputs and outputs, and what he found that was most striking was threefold variation in per capita cost. These numbers are for 2012. He first published this in 1996. So the pregnant question is what? Are the outcomes any better if we're spending three times as much? They must be, right? Well, my colleague Elliot Fisher spent seven years determining that no, with higher intensity and higher costs, the outcomes are no better in mortality and function, if anything worse. There's more difficulty for patients seeing doctors in, with longer waits. There's more difficulty for doctors admitting to hospitals and obtaining referrals. Poor patient relationships and ability to provide quality care. Sources of waste and harm. We've been talking about overuse and underuse of preference sensitive care, failure to deliver effective health care safely, overuse of supply sensitive care. You think this is an American problem? 152 PCTs in the uh, uh, United Kingdom when Muir and uh, Phil De Silver published the first NHS atlas. Threefold variation among the PCTs in per capita cost for cancer and heart disease care. Eightfold variation in stents for stable heart disease after the buildup in capacity through the NHS plan from 2001 to 2008. That's the distribution of rates. Sixfold variation within the city of London itself. I would um, suggest you might want to read this. I'm going to go through it very quickly. This is a, a white paper that is available free uh, for download on the King's Fund site. Um, we were asked to write about the relationship between practice variation, shared decision making, and commissioning. And this was our uh, attempt to be helpful with that. Um, you can see the challenging, uh, the erroneous assumptions that we were challenging. Uh, the need to support accurate preference diagnosis. The consequence of a preference misdiagnosis are every bit as great for the patient as a disease misdiagnosis. In both cases, you get the wrong treatment. Think about it from the perspective of breast cancer. Think about it from the perspective of coronary artery disease. And you need new dedicated teams within the NHS to make this kind of innovation a reality. Now, um, you, you talked about complexity. And basically, the Stacy diagram is my favorite model of it. And basically, I'm going to make the argument you did very, very quickly. Our goal is to reduce the uncertainty as much as possible. Our goal is not to reduce disagreement among patients about the utilities of different outcomes. In fact, we want to celebrate it if we want care to be patient-centered. Down in the zone of control is where you can think like the architect or engineer and specify what people do. But out here and here, if you overspecify, you get all these end runs. So the argument is you've got to come up with some simple rules. Direction setting. The goal is to give people the care they need and want, no less but no more. The way we do that is no decisions made in the face of avoidable ignorance. And what we most care about and reward is showing manifest respect for the individual by learning what matters to them. The simple rules are meant to be indisputable. Politicians, patients, clinicians. Anyone here want to argue? Interestingly, there's a real opportunity here. Patients, family. This is the same triangle. I just turned it on its side. Usually, we say, gosh, you know, you can try and create contestability and, and uh, an internal market. Um, you can do what you can to increase client power. Um, but there's always going to be a symmetry of vulnerability, if not information. So you got to go this long arm of accountability, voice, and then the compact. And what we believe is that we're not measuring what we need to in order to be sure that this bi-directional exchange of equally important information happens. If we built the system, primary care and population health, to be sure that happens, no avoidable ignorance at the level of the individual, we need to be able to measure, and that's what collaborate this new three-item measure that Glenn Elwin and his team has built at Dartmouth 
that I can tell you about during the question period. And that gives you data to hold health professionals accountable for doing what they ought to want to do. You're not forcing them to do something. You're saying no avoidable ignorance and manifest respect. It's the simple rules. And if you use option grids, which we're doing with NICE in the case of atrial fibrillation, you've got this other feedback loop. You're adding the aggregate of revealed preferences coming from informed choice to supplement voice. It's not one or two or three patient advocates in the room as you're developing guidelines. Who knows where they are in the distribution, right, of utilities? And every patient knows that. I don't have time to go through this, but it's really important, so I'm just going to breeze through it. Um, I don't believe this will happen unless we rethink teamwork among clinical teams. And there's a great example from business where if you look at the difficulty of level of training skills and the difficulty of the task, well, this 45 degree line is something I came up with, but it's very interesting because everything below the 45 degree line, whoops, I'm sorry, everything below the 45 degree line is inefficient. Right? You've got highly trained people doing very simple things. Everything above it is potentially ineffective or unsafe. But in the business world, this makes people really nervous because it looks like for any level of training, you're doing the same thing all the time. There's this one finite spot where you're both efficient and safe. And uh, that doesn't feel good, right? So what we need to measure is the level of what's called in the business world relational coordination. Does everybody on the team have shared goals, shared knowledge about the interdependencies and mutual respect, which leads to trust? That's an easy measure. We're taking collaborate and extending it to integrate, which is relational coordination plus communication continuity. Finally, uh, uh, so I, this is a giveaway here. I'm, I'm arguing, and, and Trish and I had this conversation yesterday, that you could have another two by two that is context specificity on the horizontal axis and measurement subjectivity on the vertical axis, and we've defined science too narrowly around the origin. And we talk about the art of medicine being up here. Does that all sound familiar? Robert Evans, another favorite economist of mine, said in 1989, doctors cite their scientific training to assert their authority. They talk about the art of medicine to preserve their autonomy. I think we need to expand the science. And I think that you mentioned fair abend against method. I don't think this is a question of method. I think this is a question of not measuring what matters most. And fair abend and Popper and Kuhn would all agree that expanding these measures into what matters is science. Now, I think I probably ought to stop there to be, um, there's a, this, there's a global implication here that I'll just mention. All of the work that I'm describing now took off at Dartmouth. I went to Dartmouth because Jim Young Kim became the president in 2009 and wanted to use Dartmouth's distinctive history to change the world of healthcare. So we um, believe that that can be done by looking at variation across the globe. We talk about threefold variation being important. It's 500-fold across the globe, 500-fold. 9,000 per capita in our country, 2,000. I mean, sorry, $20 in Eritrea. Everything I'm talking about has enormous relevance, greater relevance in the developing world because there's less resistance to change because you're not fighting against the built capacity. 18% of our economy, 9% of, of yours. 4.5% in China, for instance. So I'm just quickly, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be mHealth. It's going to be teams. And the focus is going to be on this bidirectional exchange for, for Rich and Martin. J. Allison Glover, 1938, in the ENT room on Wimpole Street. Tenfold variation tonsillectomy. Eightfold risk of death with surgical treatment, Rich. Um, the response, he called it the strange bare facts of incidents. The tendency for the operation to be performed for no particular reason and no particular result. That's a quote from the then president of the equivalent of the Medical Research Council. And then the president of the RSM said, yes, and isn't it sad to reflect that many of the anesthetic deaths were due to unnecessary operations? So that's just an argument for all that you're doing to create the evidence to deal with the probabilities. 
the last mile, if you run a marathon, the last mile, if you've got 25.2 down, you've got one to go, but it's not an easy one. You've got the 25.2, in my view, with the kind of, of volunteer organization that has created such a wealth of information around the probabilities. We just need to bring the patient perspective, the patient's utilities, into what we call evidence by um, aggregating them and understanding the impact that they should have on the capacities we build in our healthcare systems, the services we commission or decommission in order to give people the care they need and want, no less but no more. This actually is um, coming back to the pathos. This is very meaningful in Boston. You all know what happened on the 117th. Um, so there were, there were about 16,000 runners a year ago. There were 36,000 this year. And they had to cap it. They had to say no more. Thank you all. Thanks for, uh, very much indeed. Uh, and just to, so to, uh, you're, you're aware, um, Al will be going through these things in a little more detail in one of the master classes uh, after lunch. But I'm going to take <coughs> Chairman's prerogative and just, have, just take five minutes of questions and just intrude a little bit into our lunch hour. Anyone got any questions or, or comments for either of the other speakers here? Oh, okay, at the back there, Barney. Barney Reeves, um, I'm really a great fan of Daniel Kahneman's work. Um, and I wondered, well, let me just put it as a question. Um, David Sackett showed a slightly different scenario to the 18 patients with 44 comorbidities when he looked at an, a take he did. He showed that there are lots of common conditions accounting for most of the patients. Um, I've heard Daniel Kahneman talk, admittedly, on television, but I think you know, with practice, you can work in um, the, the second, the slower, the, the, the uh, process. And uh, can't we direct ourselves through learning and education with all that knowledge to, to, to deal better with common conditions, at least? Uh, I agree, and I've written about it. I call it hot sinking. I was just in a conversation in Boston with some of the family medicine residents, and they said, you mean hot sinking? That's what you're talking about. So for a general practitioner, a general practitioner will see about 30 or 40 conditions commonly. That's quite a lot. Specialists see a lot less than that. But for a, for, let's make it hard. Let's say a GP sees 30 or 40 conditions commonly. And they're different depending upon your population. So you have to look at it yourself. And that will account for about two-thirds of the things that present. So my attitude to this is we've got to get really good at informing ourselves about the things that we see commonly. So if, I, if I'm going to see my GP and I've got diabetes, I expect to be really good at diabetes and depression and hypertension and schizophrenia and the things that you would expect somebody to see commonly, the common infections, the contraception, you know, that's fine. So, so the mushy river fever or even hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I wouldn't expect a general practitioner to be great at. And even if they'd been to some education in the last five years on cardiomyopathy, I wouldn't rely on their recollection of what the diagnostic features are or what the treatment should be, because they'll have bounded rationality and have remembered four words out of 20. So hot sinking every now and again on the common things is absolutely the way forward, but we don't teach people how to do that, and they don't do it. I would just add that I think that um, in, in the common conditions, particularly chronic conditions where um, patient co-management or co-creation of value is so important, is where the greatest opportunities are for um, the kind of teamwork that I was talking about um, to create much greater efficiency. Um, I think that, that uh, we, we've been doing some, some um, high-level collaboration in, in China, for instance, because they were the inspiration for the Declaration of Almada um, back in 1978 because they had very low-level trained people supported by public health measures and other activities and dramatic improvement in their, um, in their mortality rates. Um, and what, what we've argued to them is that they're, they're heading in all the wrong directions now. They're, they're, they're focusing on 
um, the acute medicine model where it's highly trained people doing things to other people who are anesthetized or otherwise incapacitated by fear or illness. Um, when in fact, the vast majority of primary care and population health, to my view, and that's why I let you know that I wrote that textbook, I'm trying to provide some credibility here, is this bi-directional exchange of information. And if you take that seriously and build the systems to do it the way other service industries do, you could make care dramatically more efficient, make it dramatically more gratifying for the physicians, the highly trained people, um, and have better outcomes. Communities of practice are really important. You saw that on the Mindline slide. Uh, if you get something happening locally in that way, it happens in that way. And if it's the right thing to do, then you get more consistency of care. Yes. You emphasise that a lot of clinical behaviour is essentially habitual. So, um, you know, people behave in, in the sort of habitual way. Now, when you try and change people's habits, you can actually focus on their intentions and motivations and, and, and so forth. But you can also change the environmental cues for those habits. Now, in most of commerce and supermarkets, they don't say anything to us, but they change our behavior in quite dramatic ways by changing the environments in which we operate. But when it comes to health services and hospitals, even though we own the environment, we being you know, the NHS, we just don't change it. We don't seem to have any control over it. Can't we sort of grasp the environment and start... So when a new trial shows something's dramatically effective, make sure it's obviously placed in the environment, in, in a red box, that they'll pick it up. Um, but we, we sort of neglect all of that that we've... That, that, supermarkets know we don't take any account of at all. Um, I, I don't think it's true that we don't do any of that, but we probably could do more of it. It's called cognitive forcing strategies. The, the best one that people who are old enough will remember was that when cash machines, ATMs, were introduced into the UK, what, what happened was you got the money first and the card came out last. So what did people do? They walk away, now they've got the money, and they leave the card in the machine. So they switched it around. Now what happens? You have to take your card before the money comes. It's a cognitive forcing strategy. And people leave their cards there much less often. There, there's, there's another... There's a, before, before you go on, what's the cognitive forcing... Give me an example in medicine of that. Well, there's a GP uh, computer system called Script Switch. People familiar with Script Switch? OK, so it's a sort of pop-up menu that can be populated locally. And if you type in something that maybe isn't the local policy or isn't now the national guideline, you'll get a pop-up message. It doesn't say, um, absolutely, you can't prescribe this, but it says, think about the alternative. You write a, 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 a quinolone down for a sore throat, and it says, don't you mean penicillin V or paracetamol? That sort of, yeah, that's a cognitive forcing strategy. You don't see it much in secondary care because the, the, the IT infrastructure is much more dispersed. But that's the sort of thing that's coming through. And I do know we're getting you know, oncology programs where you can't pre prescribe the wrong dose um, you know, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the chemotherapy. It actually stops you doing it rather than advises you to do it. So it's coming. It's just not, you know, it's a mere gray thing. That, you know, the future is, is there, but it's just not adequately dispersed yet. I, I, I was just going to add very quickly. I, I think that the great opportunity is to um, do what... Um, supermarkets or credit card companies do, or what Amazon does, um, which is, is personalize the appeal to, um, to the client, to the consumer. Um, and you see that every time you go on, on, online. You're reminded of something that you were looking at on, on Amazon. And um, that kind of big data analytics was introduced in Europe by American Express 15, 20 years ago. And it's everywhere now. It's throughout the world. It's not in healthcare. And we don't have the data that would be most valuable because people don't get to reveal their preferences with informed choice, the way I was describing. Um, if, if we, and, and most of our EMRs, uh, our EMRs are based on electronic medical records that were designed for reimbursement primarily. So we're, we're, we don't have the data we would want to have in order to bring the service together with the clients, together with the people we serve. 
the, the way marketers can in the private sector and do in the private sector. That's why this bi-directional exchange, finding a way to make it happen, is so important. Okay, I'm going to stop there, I'm afraid, because we're out we're of time, but, but, but our speakers will be around. Do feel color them. Now, before anyone moves, it's, it's an ancient and laudable Cochrane tradition that we have a photograph. I'd like, Mike, if you, Holly here in green, if you follow Holly, we're going to go straight out of here, straight down the stairs towards the cloakroom and just out into the little quadrangle there. There'll be one photo, it'll take five minutes and then you can grab your lunch and we'll see you back here later on. Thank you. Thanks again to the speakers.